an art and literary professor who was in Paris with his class when he suddenly had a stomach rupture, an ulcer rupture, peritonitis, shock, sudden death, clinical death, resuscitation, hell experience. I was a 38-year-old college professor and I taught art and I had taken a group of students and my wife and we had gone around Europe and we had just done three week tour and this was the next to the last day and we were in Paris and at 11 o'clock in the morning I had um, a perforation of my stomach. When this happened the pain was the most acute pain I'd ever experienced in my life and it just dropped me right down to the ground and so I'm twisting and kicking and moaning and screaming and yelling around on the floor and my wife called an emergency called the desk and they called an emergency service a doctor came and he called an ambulance because he knew what was wrong and they took me about eight miles across town to the public hospital to the general hospital of paris where i was taken into emergency examined by two more doctors who knew exactly what was wrong with me and then they took me away to the surgery hospital which was a couple blocks away and i was parked there because there wasn't any surgeon available to do the surgery and so there i lay for um, eight to ten hours in that hospital with no medication no examination, no attention whatsoever, awaiting a surgeon to come to give me this operation that was critical. And it's now 8.30 at night. The nurse came in and said that they were very sorry they weren't able to get a doctor for me and they'd get one the next day. Well, when she said that, I knew that it was over for me. I knew that I was dead. The only thing that was keeping me alive was I didn't want to die. I was scared to death of dying because as far as I knew, I was an atheist, non-believer, person who lived for their, the gratification they could get out of the moment. And you know, like dying to me was like the worst. I mean, next to the pain, dying was the worst thing that could happen to you because it's the end of life and there was no more. There wasn't anything else. But when she said that, the idea of trying to exist for another minute, another hour in this pain, it wasn't worth it anymore. I'd been hanging on in the hopes that they told me that they'd get a doctor and do the surgery and open me up and, and fix the problem inside of me, but when they said they couldn't get one. So I said to my wife, it's time for us to say goodbye because I'm going to die now. And she got up and she put her arms around me and lying in the bed and she told me how much she loved me and I told her how much I loved her and this makes me really sad to think about this. And um, we made our goodbyes, you know, said those things that you'd say to the, we'd been married 20 years, say all those kinds of things. I can't tell you because I'd just start crying, but um, she finally sat down because she knew it was over and I knew. And it was just so hard looking at her, crying like that. And I just closed, closed my eyes, just let it go. And I went unconscious. I probably was unconscious for a very short while, a few minutes probably. And I was conscious again. And I looked, opened my eyes and looked, and I was standing up next to my bed. And I knew exactly where I was and what the situation was. I mean, there was no confusion in my mind. I felt um, more alive, more real than I've ever felt in my life. You know, people ask me, you know, were you a ghost? I was, the op I was just the opposite, very alive. As I'm looking around the room, I see that there's underneath the sheet on the bed, there's something under the sheet, a body. And so I bent over the bed, the head was turned away from me, and I looked at the face, and it looked like me. But that wasn't possible because I was standing there. I'm alive. I'm great. You know, I mean, I'm more than great. I'm like, you know. And so I tried to talk to my wife. Can't you hear me? And can't you hear me? You know, she couldn't hear me or That's see me. That's not me. But I thought that here? she just was ignoring me. 
So I got very angry at her for ignoring me, for not paying attention to me. And I'm screaming and yelling at her, what's going on here? Why, why is this body in the bed that looks like me and how to get there and stuff like that? And I had a sneaking suspicion that the body in the bed was me. But I didn't want to think about that because that was too scary. So I'm getting really agitated and upset because this is all too weird. You know, this can't be happening. It's impossible. And I've got a hospital gown on and it's like really, everything's really real. And I hear people calling me outside the room and they're saying to me in soft, gentle voices, Howard, you got to come with us now. Come quickly. Come out here. So I go over to the doorway of the room and there's people out in the hallway and they're, um, uh, the hallway's dank. It's gray. It's not, it's not light or dark. It's just gray. And they're all in grayness. And they're men and women. And what they're wearing might possibly be hospital uniforms. Um, and I asked them if they were from the doctor to take me to the operation. And I told them I said, I'm really sick and I'm going to have an operation and I'm going to die if I don't get this operation. And I was supposed to have the operation eight hours ago. And I'm telling them all this stuff. And they're going, well, you know, we know, we know, we understand. Come quickly, you know, you come quickly. Howard, come Howard, Howard, come, Howard, come out here. here. Howard, come quickly. Come with us. Howard, we've been waiting for you. Waiting. I waiting. left the room, which was real clear, bright, and went into the hallway, which was dank and hazy, and um, followed these people. We had a very long journey. There's no, there's no time, and whenever I make a reference to time, <laughs> it's just an illusion because there was no time in this place. But this journey, if I were to recreate it, I'd have to walk like from Nashville to Louisville or something to, to recreate the, the walk with these people. And as we walked, they stayed around me and kept moving me on, and it kept getting darker and darker. Um, they were becoming more and more openly hostile to me. First, they were sort of syrupy sweet to get me to go with them, and then when I was going along with them, it was like, hurry up, keep moving, you know, shut up, stop asking questions, you know, they started getting more um, ugly. And so we get into complete darkness, and I'm absolutely terrified. These people are very hostile, I don't know where I am. I said, I'm not going to go with you any further. They said, um, you're almost there. And we started to fight. I, just, I was trying to get away from them. They were pushing and pulling at me. And um, there are now a lot of them. What originally had been like a handful now was, since it was darkness, no, but maybe hundreds or thousands. I, don't, I mean, I have no idea. And they're playing with me. You know, clearly they could have just destroyed me if they wanted to. They didn't want to destroy me. What they wanted to do was they wanted to inflict pain on me because they derived, pleasure isn't the right word, but they derived, derived satisfaction out of the pain that I experienced. So what they were doing in the beginning part was, it's real hard for me to talk about and I don't, and I'm not going to tell you much about it, just a little bit, because um, it gets, I mean, just gets too ugly. Uh, but the, initially they were like tearing and biting, um, tearing with their fingernails, scratching, gouging, ripping, and then uh, biting. And trying to defend myself, trying to fight them off, trying to get away from them, but this it's like being um, in a beehive. Just hundreds of them.